Uh, second lecture, we're still in week one. Um, I hope you uh, at least got an overview of the research challenges in multimodal. Um, today is a kind of a, I would call a special lecture because we, um, we're not yet in the theory of it. It's really because we designed this course to be a big component of it, the course project. Uh, I love research. And uh, at some point I was like, I cannot have 25 students, uh, but I would love to work with so many students. So let's uh, do a course where we can work on many research projects, uh, team projects, and I can be as involved as I can in, in this. So that the course is a mix of sharing my passion about multimodal, but also at the same time, trying to build a really fun research over the semester. Um, so today, uh, the um, uh, the schedule will be we'll, we'll go over the course syllabus just because uh, just to be sure we're all on the same page. Um, in fact, I swatch the swap the the second and the third. Uh, we'll 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 talk about what is a good research topic, a good research question, or a good research idea. Uh, to share some insights, and then I, I give a mini historical view. I always feel old when I share that, but I, I think it's good to realize that multimodal research happened not just starting 2015 or not even starting 2020 for, for younger students. Um, and, and then we'll share some uh, ideas for multimodal data sets. The full list is more than 100 data sets. I'm not going to go over that, but just share an, a, a, a glimpse of what all the interesting and i probably will not have time to but we also have in the slides that are available online example of project from previous year to kind of give you an idea these are projects that end up with the publication um i will say on average maybe about 20 percent of the projects end up uh with uh publication uh but i will say uh, one thing i want to share up front your grade has nothing to do with state-of-the-art performance, nothing to do. In fact, if less, uh, most of the time, if I mean, if you get better improvement, that's great, but this is research. I mean, the research sometimes works, sometimes don't work. The really important thing is you learn something about the process, the multimodal process in this. Yeah. So the course syllabus, um, we designed the course with three learning paradigms, three learning paradigms. One are the lectures. Uh, the course is designed for live lectures um, in person. This is an in-person course. Um, we will record uh, them. We record them for two purposes. One is for later in the day. If you want to go back and look at it again, follow your new your 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 notes. Um, if for some reason, for health reason, you're not able to join, you can watch it from home. Um, and then uh, I'll as we will talk more. You have to give your uh, uh, highlight form the same day of. We'll give more details on that in a second. There are not, no highlight form today, uh, just to confirm. There's no highlight form. Um, um, so that's the course lectures. Uh, the reading assignment, and that's, that's a question of like, how many papers can you read and, and should you read? And, and there's so many interesting papers. We reduced it, uh, which I think is bare minimum, but I think we need some reading and you will do some as part. There's two places where you will do reading. You will reading, which are part of the curriculum, of part of the syllabus. And you also have reading for your own course project, a literature review for your course project. Um, and finally, the pro course project assignment are really the core of this uh, um, so all uh, everything will be uh, all our communication we decided will go through Piazza and we put both uh, all the registered students there, but also we are currently also putting all waitlisted students until we stabilize uh, with uh, with this um, course recommendation. So here's the bare minimum. By now you should I, I think I had mentioned it ready to read at the minimum six papers. Okay, at the minimum like. So uh, six weeks where you have to read one paper, do a summary, I will give you more details about it. And for your course project, you will have a literary review. So you, in fact, it's more than six, sorry. Uh, it's six plus your literature review. You should have already taken a machine learning course. If you, it is at CMU, 
this is great, it, it, but there's a lot of great courses on machine learning outside. And as I mentioned last lecture, you should have some knowledge of deep learning. Uh, enter like a library like PyTorch should not be a surprise for you. If it is decide to take it and still don't have all this, it's still possible, but it will be a steep learning curve. So we highly suggest this course is going to be taught also in, in the spring and in the fall every semester. And you need to be motivated for a course project. We designed a course project so that at the end you have a research paper. Now, is it a research paper you will submit? You, you, this, is, this is your decision, but it will be the same format. I think we're picking ICML, the International Conference of Machine Learning, as the format for uh, this. So you're already ready. The deadline is January, end of January. So if you decide, you can go ahead. Um, the course grade, so the highlight, the lecture highlights, every, um, um, every lecture uh, will have a, a, a starting next week. Um, so you can count uh, now the number. Uh, no, sorry, I think there's a, a total of 20 lectures. Um, but this first week, there's no lecture highlights, so there are 18. Um, and we're picked the 16 best of your 18. And that's how we get the, but yeah, there are lecture highlights for every lecture moving forward. Reading assignment, two points per assignment. The course project, we split it. So as I mentioned, all the, your, your assignment that you will normally have on a course, you, we have them. It's just that we, you do them with your own data set uh, project together. Um, so the project preference, the, that's your homework uh, tomorrow and on Tuesday. I mean, there's Labor Day weekend uh, in between. Um, so we want a project preferences. What is it you prefer? And I will walk through this over this lecture, but that's, you have some uh, first assignment due on Tuesday. Um, and then the pre-proposal is due eight days later, uh, eight days later. So the pre-proposal, by that time, you know your data set, and you know, um, and then we'll give you more details about each of the other assignment that walks you through it uh, to this. Um, so the lecture highlights, as I giving you a glimpse at, about it. So starting this Tuesday, bring your laptop and there you take notes while I speak, <laughs> but don't take too many notes, but just enough. Uh, the minimum is every 30 minutes, there should be two things you remember from uh, from what I've, I've talked about. I will in fact set an alarm on my cell phone. Uh, so every 30 minutes it will beep. Um, so um, summarize the whole lecture uh, to uh, take away or a short paragraph of the lecture. And then the part that we found really useful are the questions. Any questions, I mean, there's no bad question. Like any question, they really like if you had a question, most likely other students had the same question in mind. So put them there. You can ask through live also, but this is, and uh, this has to be done the, at, uh, by midnight, the same day of. Um, so 10, 10, we start, even if we start late, doesn't change. Uh, 10, 40 is the first segment. I mean, we're not gonna like, like, oh, it's a topic that was like a minute after the, 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 the but we're not like that picky, but like one segment, a second segment. And the third segment is, uh, even if we end the class uh, earlier or later, the third segment is that last part, okay? Um, so, and we share also the slide, by the way, for people who love taking notes directly on slide or things like this, they're already there. I tried to post them the night before, Sometimes it happens a little bit later, but the slides are always available on Piazza. Um, so the reading assignment. So here's the thing. Originally, we had every week, like two or three papers that you have to read. Now, I still want you to know about those four papers that I really think are relevant. But the, 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 the design is that we take the class and we randomly split it in a discussion group of about eight to 10 students. And that will be, uh, unless something happened and some discussion groups, uh, there's some dynamic that we need to change, but we may end up keeping the same discussion group for most of the semester. We may change it halfway, but the idea is you have a discussion group and these uh, people, you, you're kind of make, doing work for them because you're gonna read one paper, summarize it, and then, uh, you will eventually read the other summaries from others. So you're kind of nicely, you get four papers for the price of one because you're, you're getting the papers you've read and then you will 
uh, get the summary. So you get one point for the summary that you make, uh, the, the summary of the paper. And then you ask for each of the other summaries to write a follow-up post on Piazza. This will be all through Piazza. A follow-up post and will be detailed instruction. They already in fact in Piazza, the instruction, what should be that follow-up, but just follow-up ideas from that summary. Now, how does it relate to the paper you've read? Make some links like this. So in that you get four papers, but you only read one. You're always welcome to read the others. Um, to uh, help with this process, so Monday before 8 p.m., we will always release the four papers to be read that week. Um, we're trying to release them before. Right now, this week is a little bit special um, because we're, if, if we're lining up to give you a brand new paper as um, at the, the new multimodal survey paper we've been working for the last year and a half. You guys will be the first one to get it. Um, so you're going to be the guinea pig in the reading it, uh, but it also will share a lot of the vision we had for the course and uh, a lot of the citation. So, um, so um, Monday 8 p.m. and then there's usually four papers, or in this case one paper and four parts to it. That's the way we will uh, do it. Wednesday, you need to select your paper. It's a Google form. You just enter your Andrew ID. And try, because it's a, a group of eight or 10, to have at least two people per papers, like not like 10 people on one, uh, and then we don't have. So on purpose, try to uh, naturally balance it. By Friday, your summary is posted, and by Monday night, your follow-up post is. We have only six weeks out of, out of 14 where we have one. Two of them, I think, is week two, three, uh, and I forgot the other ones. It's all in the syllabus. Um, so, but on Monday we will uh, put this. So, any question at this point for reading assignment and highlight forms? Okay. So um, we understand, especially since for the last two years, that has been more. But things happen. It's possible you need uh, for health reason or other reasons, so for travel, for conference. So we really want you. Um, to not stress. I mean, learning should be a fun experience. So we are putting six wild cards um, for either lecture highlight or reading assignment. These are automatically, um, so you don't need to notify us, but you, we automatically see if you're delayed, uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll take on from your bank. Um, you can email, message us if you'd like to know how many do you have left, but you, you can count as well. Um, and, and we also give you two for the project assignment, but these projects are all teams. Um, so, so if possible, I'll keep them for the final uh, one where you're the most, like at the end of the semester have maybe a, the, the most deadline, but for some reason you need it. Um, so each of these wild cards, so your total of eight, but six of them are individual and eight, uh, two of them are team level, but each of them give you 24 hours extension a one day extension for uh, for this and no partial credit like, oh, I only use half of one. It's just like the accounting. If we start putting it per hour would be just uh, so like if you um, uh, and the, yeah, automatically calculate it. for the um, for the project one. We appreciate if you do send us a note on Piazza in advance, just so we know, because the, these the, the grading, we try to be as efficient as possible for the grading. If we know yours will come later, we can reprioritize other ones to grade, yes. Is there a maximum number of points? Uh, yes, uh, um, as, as, uh, sorry, for the, uh, I think the, um, the maximum is 72 hours. Um, and the main reason is, 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 is also grading, uh, uh, but, if, if you think for some reason, I mean, there's, there's always like we want that we would like to know in advance if you think for some reason, like an emergency happened or something, just let us know. And uh, but the by default, the 48 hours for certain, I think the in the syllabus would say 72 hours. Yeah. Uh, but if you need more, you just let us know. Um, and the details of it, so the syllabus is a relatively longer document. It is on Piazza. It is also available on Canvas. Uh, so take a moment to read that. I know it's a lot of reading, but uh, so the course project. Okay, so the course project. Um, uh, 
so at least two modalities. I mean, it's a multimodal <laughs> class. So, uh, so if you come, ah, it's language and then another language. I'm like, yeah, multilingual is really interesting, but it's it's still unimodal. Sorry. Um, so um, so we um, we try very hard to have the course not just about language and vision. But I have to say, a lot of the previous research has been about language and vision. And so um, there is a, a slight preference for data set that, that follow like language and vision, where it's not a requirement, but please talk with us if you have other data sets you would like to look at. Uh, for example, self-driving is another one that's interesting, but it comes with its own challenges. Talk with us and talk with your TA uh, to, 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 to do this. So teams of three, four, or five, we will make sometime an exception for six, but never an exception for two. Okay, and one definitely not. Um, and and it's all a question. We hope to have a, have, a, have about twenty teams uh, in that range. We can handle this. The, the the course goes well. If we suddenly have forty teams. This is a different ballgame and a lot of the learning objective and the feedback and the level of, 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 of involvement that, that will be just doesn't scale. And so that's why we, we've been keeping the course always in that range of about 100, to always for that reason, uh, because we want to give you feedback. If the course was only about lectures and not about a course project, we could have scaled it. But because it's about a course project and research, um, we don't. So please, uh, teams, uh, four and five is probably the most preferred. I'm kind of uh, uh, adding a little bit more this year, hoping that more teams are on the higher end. Um, so, But we found a team of six being a little bit challenging. So only if you have a really good plan on how you collaborate will we accept that. Uh, but it, it's a very challenging four is, is, is a magic number that seems to work really well. Um, we want to explore new research ideas. And so, uh, and I will give you, and, and, and don't worry, like we have another, like, in fact, for the next month and a half, we're going to go through so many steps to just help you explore research ideas. And so it's not like you need to have it right now. We'll work together. But we want to try to explore something slightly different than just the current literature. Um, there are many uh, paper. Um, what we found also workshops are also a great place sometimes for, for the projects, but also uh, for uh, papers. research. At least have the time. Research does not succeed. I mean, this is research. You're trying an idea, but it is okay to not have a better performance uh, than like previous model, as long as you know why. And that's really what we will spend this time is trying to understand uh, both the previous work and your own research idea. We'll talk more on the GPUs uh, because that's also. Uh, but we do have some credits. Um, usually, they're like about fifty. Uh, $50 of credits and we can get a few, but it is definitely something to think about when you decide uh, to pick a, a project. Like if suddenly you're like, oh, I want to do video or 3D videos, or um, you just have to be aware that these take a lot more GPU. So. Um, so here's the timeline for the project. Pre-proposal due in about two weeks from now. By that time, in two weeks from now, you already have a team, you already have probably a most likely data set and some ideas of like research direction you'd like to explore. Um, so that's pre-proposal. The first project proposal is going to do a literature review. And for people doing research, a lot of you like literature review, related work should not be done the week before submission. Uh, and not that any of you will ever have done that, but yeah. So, but the literature review early on, find out what happened. Also help a little bit to find out what exists and that helps maybe for your research ideas. The second one is where you explore your data set in a more unimodal way, understand each modality. Um, and then the midterm is a key moment. You implement state-of-the-art approach, at least one, two, or three approaches, and there you go and understand where do they succeed, where do they fail, why do they fail. Um, and finally, we left a good uh, five weeks in between the midterm and the final to really do the, the research on your final project. Um, so uh, that the, the challenge we ask ourselves, like, like, 
we a, a good 70% of the grades is going to be team based and 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 we've been developing over the years some methodology to ensure that everybody is working um, we will continue to do that, for example, in the assignment, each assignment to get feedback from about what each uh, teammates have done. We have a GitHub that we can, uh, we, uh, the TAs will have access to. Um, but at the end of the day, we, if we don't get feedback, we cannot, um, we cannot intervene. Here's what happened almost 99.9% .9 of the time. If a teammate for some reason is not working as much, it's often that there's another reason behind it because we're in a very, uh, very exciting place, CMU. Very, everybody is very smart. Everybody is very willing. If, if someone is not involved, there's often another reason behind it. And that's where we can come and, and discuss with the teammates and team and, and, and find a place. But if we find out about it a week before the final, it's too late. So if it, so don't see it as, oh, I'm talking against my teammates. I don't want to know. If there is this something, uh, it's all confidential if you share something, but if you share something and we, we, we discuss, we usually have a, we have a, a protocol in place to, to, to bring it in a very constructive way because 99% of the time was always there was some other things and then we work with the one or two other student that maybe were involved and usually all of this goes well but let us know earlier than later even yourself if you're like hey there's other things happening let us know we'll work with you where you're here to have fun that's the uh the process that's to check to find the teammates it's, it's a challenging one. A lot of you may be on your first semester. You may or may not have like teammates you already had in mind, but that's okay. We'll go together with a, a process also for that. So today's lecture, talk about data set, uh, start giving you ideas for research uh, questions. Um, on Tuesday uh, by 8 p.m., I think on Tuesday, we'll have a form that you need to fill. It's, uh, I think, already online, the form. Uh, there's a form, Google form. Uh, that you feel which kind of research idea you'd like to uh, area you'd like to share uh, explore data sets but also research question you're interested in because sometimes you have two two uh, you have two versions like you have a student who just really want to work let's say on healthcare but the exact research question they're like a little bit more flexible or other ones are just like we really understand like i don't know i really want to work on self-supervised learning or something like this like they're really interested in one so sharing both and sometimes you have an interest in both but she, let's share that and uh, we will share those preferences so be aware these preference you're sharing is something we'll share with the whole group uh, so that you can look at other people who have similar uh, one uh, exit and then on Thursday, in a week from now, we will end the, meet, the course lecture a little bit earlier with the team matching exercise. Um, we will allow, uh, we're, we're trying to do any kind of automatic clustering based on word embeddings. Well, I don't know if we're going to get that far, uh, but we all at least have like areas of data sets and like, so you can discuss and, and change. Um, uh, we'll have the pre-proposal on Wednesday, and also we'll post them soon, the TAs, and uh, we'll have extra office hours, um, uh, office hours too, like if you want to discuss ideas as well, you can talk with, with them, so. And you can at any time also uh, discuss with me and Paul, the two instructors, um, both at the end of the class is usually a good time. I always reserve, uh, at least for my schedule, I reserve about half an hour after the class, just in case people have questions. Um, and also um, piazza, and then we can always have ad hoc meetings if needed. So the preference uh, is which research area, you, the, the, the form you will have to fill by Tuesday, uh, the, the preference for research area, uh, the multimodal data set, we, we, we coded all the multimodal data sets. Uh, we coded, in fact, twice, and now you're going to see it. We coded just a unique identifier, but also we kind of started looking at them and see, because there's data sets I really want you to know about, but I probably don't want you to do a project about it. Like, like it's just like, for example, MS Coco is a wonderful data set for image captioning. It just it changed. It was a moment in multimodal where this like came with this. 
but it's been there for like seven years. Like everything has been tried on MS Coco. Um, so don't go and do a project with MS Coco. And then there's some newer one that will be interesting. So we're trying also how easy is it to find a GitHub with that has some initial code with that data set? How easy is it to get the data itself? So we really love movie graph wonderful data set created uh, in the University of Toronto, but getting the data, there is a lot of uh, steps um, and some of an initial data is not available anymore. So that's what we, we went through this. Um, so the, the schedule and uh, super, so the project preference, the pre-proposal, the first assignment at the end of that week, uh, second assignment, uh, the midterm, and then the final assignment. I already went through the schedule uh, on Tuesday. I, and for some reason, you like uh, um, decide that it doesn't fit your schedule or you have colleagues or friends who are still on the wait list and may or may not get in. We are teaching it also in the spring. Jonathan and Daniel will co-teach it. So what is a good research idea? And, and I know it sounds obvious, but there is a really well-established scientific methodology, which sometime in AI and, and computer science we forget, but it's really well established where you look, you observe, you maybe even look a literature review, you make some question and importantly some hypothesis, you test these hypotheses, you look at the results of them, and then you finally write your discussion, your conclusion. That's, that's a scientific methodology that we sometimes forget in, in, in computer science and AI, but I think, um, and I, I, we're not gonna force you exactly to follow that. Uh, for example, we're a little bit more uh, lenient on the hypothesis part. We allow like, uh, but, but when you think about it, try it. Like if you're about to test something, try a new alignment or new multimodal representation, what do you expect? Like, what do you expect the result to be? What do you, why do you think that this uh, new uh, algorithm will succeed in that task? Because underlying, there must be some mechanics that is happening and try to understand that. So, so the, the research question should be more than, hey, there's a really cool new blip or clip version or, uh, that came out. And I really think that on my data set is going to give me sight of the art performance. Like, it, 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 what I would like is why do you think that this approach will be better for that data? And, and now, how could you test? that this is really the reason you got an improvement because let's say you get an improvement, great, but why did it happen? Oh, you didn't get an improvement, it got worse. Okay, why did it get worse? These are wonderful questions. So that's a little bit how we will work together. So there's at least two methodology for finding good research ideas, at least two. One is bottom up and that one, and we're in fact gonna try both approaches in the course, uh, we're kind of trying to enable you to do both. The bottom up is uh, understanding the existing research uh, and understanding specifically its success and particularly its failings. And from there, kind of building up from that. So, hey, Mike, the state of the art fails on, on, on these kind of images, on this kind of videos. Let me try to understand why and let me try to maybe develop something that improved from that. The top down design is, 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 is in a sense for somewhat bigger ideas, but more like challenging because you don't have as much ground. Like you, there's this interesting direction, you're, you're hypothesizing that maybe um, uh, trying with a, a fourth modality would be a good thing. So, like, so, so these are usually not as much as the looking just at the data and previous approaches. You may be looking at the data, but not necessarily at previous research on that data, but more your own intuition, your reading from that. So for the first bottom up, we designed, in fact, the course, not that I want you to do incremental research, but I want you to have kind of almost of a backup plan. Like if we don't, if the top down approach or a way of finding research idea doesn't succeed, at least we got the bottom up. Uh, and the bottom up, a lot of good ideas, some of them very impactful comes from a bottom up approach. So there's nothing bad with this. 
So this is why we designed, especially the midterm report in that sense, where you implement the state of the art, do an error analysis, the error data analysis, and find from there what are the failures and why are they failing, and that will help you uh, 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 and uh, find uh, maybe a better way to improve on that. So, um, so that's the bottom up. For the top down, uh, we hope that every team is going to do brainstorming. That personally is the part that I love the most about research. Uh, my students know it. When they come to me, there is always a whiteboard and, and they always leave by taking a photo of the whiteboard because we brainstorm and, 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 and talk on this. So, um, so uh, brainstorm, like don't force yourself like right away in the first day or first week to know exactly your research idea. Take the time to brainstorm. Also, um, we, the literature review could be seen as a bottom up or a top down, but read, go, go beyond your own. Um, if you have a data set you're interested in, read about it, the work that was done, but read outside. Think of other like topics that are related, but not exactly what this is doing. And some really good idea comes from transferring information from one field, research field from another. Uh, project hours, uh, we will have, so we kind of, the TAs, I didn't put a slide. So the way we work is we had office hours um, and, and if, if enough students would like to have a scheduled time for office hours, we will bring them back. But instead of that, what we did is every team, uh, because in two weeks you will have a team, and every team has a primary TA. That primary TA, it will be working very closely with you, will meet at the minimum four times. That's a bare minimum four times. And will always be there either on Piazza um, or any kind of, uh, you want to message them. Uh, they are there and they're really happy to meet more often if you want. And, uh, and if you want individual, they're kind of your point of contact um, uh, for, for that. Um, and we, I, we, we found like there were two key moments in the semester. One is right after you decided your data set and, and you got your team together, you're at the beginning. And there, uh, our, we, uh, both instructor, Paul and I will meet with all teams uh, and really be sure that we can share and brainstorm together. Um, you can see where things don't scale if we go beyond like even 20, 20 teams trying 20. It, it's, it's a lot of hours of meetings for, for one, but I, I wanna do it, I wanna be there. And we'll do it a second time after your midterm. After your midterm, you, you thought about it, you went even deeper. Now you can talk anytime, you, uh, especially after the class, we're happy to discuss uh, other time. So, so communicate via Piazza with your TAs or with us instructor. Okay, so um, we, uh, there are two type of uh, research questions. One which, um, are oriented towards having a hypothesis. Like you, you define a research question uh, from a, like we'll call it maybe more of a scientific research question. Like one where you, one there's like, is a specific phenomena you want to study. Um, and then from there, you're going to make a hypothesis about it. And that is a healthy thing to do. So I'm going to give you a few examples of that in from NLP, but so let's say are all languages equal, equally hard for language model? Language models, we'll discuss more uh, in a little bit, but language models uh, can be seen as understanding the structure of language to so usually are trained in a way, uh, autoregressive way where you're predicting the next word, uh, for example. But, but is, is the structure of language equally hard for every language? Um, and, and then uh, maybe based on prior literature or their own experience, then they go and say, um, it is unlikely that our language are equally easy or that our methods are equally good. So, uh, uh, but if you read the full paper, they had a more in-depth like discussion of why they think that it's equally hard. Now I know you're like, oh, but why is it equally hard? And like the next to next step, yeah, you can have follow-up question, but for each of those steps, try to give yourself like milestone, like as a first stage, oh, is it equally hard? Now you could say, go a follow-up research question after that 
and go in a little bit more detail, but don't try to solve everything up front. What makes a particular podcast broadly engaging? Uh, tips such as reduce, reducing filler words and disfluency or incorporating emotion. Um, so these are hypotheses of what would make something more engaging, less pause fillers. I need to work on that. Um, and disfluency and incorporating emotion. That one I'm good. Um, so, um, but there is, oh, um, I was about to, um, let me come back to that. But there's another type of research question, which would be called explority, explore, exploratory, hey, exploratory. <laughs> you, uh, research questions. And there is not yet a research hypothesis. Um, there's, they're more like you try, you're like, you're trying to understand a little bit like how things are. And we're, we're in a course project. We're not like, we're not deciding what is your PhD thesis topic going to be. So uh, exploratory is very valid. It's, it's definitely something you should. So, but what I would love to you to think is maybe one or two are very targeted question, maybe with even like some kind of knowledge about what the hypothesis could be. But then you have two or three, maybe more open and then research idea and research question. But try, try to do a little bit of an effort yourself to like uh, think about uh, what would be a research. Um, and, and when you think of research question, um, like does X make Y better? I know it's a nice one and, and maybe it's an, a, a interesting in some sense, but the more interesting is like, what, why is it um, and start understanding it better. So it's not just that, oh, I, I applied clip uh, or this new cool algorithm to my new data set, but like more that this was the phenomena of clip or this uh, skill or characteristic of, of clip that really was resonated well in this data. And let me try to visualize uh, the outputs of my model to try to confirm or not if 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 it was really the reason clip improve or did not. Um, so research idea one to not do is state of the art performance. This is like let's let's. Not, I mean, if you have it, I'm, I'm happy for you. You may have a better chance given the research community, especially the AI research community these days. It is unfortunately uh, we don't. Uh, produce negative results in the AI community as much. Um, let's say this way, we produce a lot of negative results, we don't publish them as much. Uh, so, and, and, there's, and, and the AI and machine learning community is well aware of that situation. And we, I think everybody is trying to work on other ways of, of sharing results, but for now, but the, these are, let me share some other example of research ideas you could look at. Uh, how to, instead of just doing multimodal fusion, let's say you pick a data set and there's already five papers already there. What are, why don't you look at a variance of it, robustness? What if some of the samples were missing? So you use the same data set, you just hide some uh, samples or some word or shuffle thing and just see how modalities will work. Um, Let's say you look at your, um, your data, maybe with some extra mini annotation, you can study some biases, like uh, some aspect in your data that your model is picking on. Um, and, and in fact, you could even go further, like eventually with fairness um, to that. It was a good, uh, Jonathan Bisk, I think had a good paper to show that multimodal can sometimes make things even worse uh, with those, um, biases, so gender biases, other kind of uh, biases. Making a data, because example, one of the research idea personally in, our, in, in my research group I'm really interested in is healthcare. And healthcare trust is really important. Like if you give a system to a doctor, I mean, the chances of them really just going and using it, you need to have them really understand the inside, like what is it? So it's not just like, hey, this person is depressed or not. I have my big AI. It was trained on a lot of data. I get 98%. Uh, that would be scary if you did that. But yeah. And then why, why, if you predict 98% for depression, you, you should look back at your data. So, but yeah, anyway, aside to, 
But yeah, why? What is it? What did the algorithm pick up on? Understanding, so a lot of time, a lot of the problem we will study, like there is one label, let's, let's, let's use depression for now. I, I just talk about it. Depression is a very complex phenomena. Um, even like after many years of studying it, we understand some aspect of it, some symptoms, some, some behaviors related with but it, it is, and, and in fact, there's, in fact, we talk about heterogeneity of, of modalities. Sometimes in, in, they will also talk about many different types, like for example, for psychosis, different type of it. So it's not just like one of them. So there is a, there's a complex input, like an heterogeneous, and the output is also complex, but what is the inference process? Like, and a lot of time we just do a uh, multiple layer of a deep neural network, but what if you look at it more as a compositional? What are the intermediate, uh, and it's a little bit more like reasoning, what are the intermediate things I need to know? So for, for example, if I make a diagnosis, Maybe I will check first about their agitation for depression. So we will look at different kinds of symptoms. And then once you ag aggregate many of them, then you can make a better assessment. So trying to take that big problem and slice it in pieces, both uh, this uh, horizontally and maybe vertically. Uh, and so look at compositionality and reasoning. Better understanding, I mean, the core concept of how modality interact with each other. Uh, it's a kind of almost more theoretical a little bit. Um, how do you make something fast and efficient? Um, now these days, I mean, multimodal is also on cell phones. You see them on cell phones and all this. So how do you make it efficient for, um, for, for memory, uh, for other things like this? So, and if you're interested in a more theoretical, um, and this we should discuss because we, we don't want just theoretical. We, we want some ways of experimenting and validating your theories. But if you have some intuition, for example, for cross-modal interaction, maybe there's a way where you could have a synthetic data set. So that's something we often do in, uh, in my group. It's like, it's like we have a concept, an idea. Before I go into this very complex multimodal data set where there's so many variables, many things, why don't I start with a simple data set, maybe generated from Gaussians and other things, just to get the hang of it, hang of it and, and go from that. So, um, but I, I don't want just that. Like if it was just on Gaussian and all this, like you, you lose, uh, like as we talk in the spectrum of heterogeneous versus homogeneous, a bunch of Gaussian is a little bit on the homogeneous side. You're not taking advantage of all the work we, we're discussing. So just to give ideas to go a little beyond. And what's nice is you can take an existing data set and with a little bit of changes of it and get a new research question. And I will say, often the most impactful research is there's something about better solution to a research question, but also the one that really have the biggest impact on the community are the one who defines new research question. So by defining new research question, you're really bringing, you're stepping, you're moving forward. Now, we should not just create research questions just for the fun of it. There should be a reason for it. There should be a goal for that. But there's something about defining good research questions. And then you can study how to solve it. But, but that comes second. The first question, what are the research idea in question? OK, this is me showing my uh, being really old uh, and being like, uh, OK, multimodal is a process that has at least four eras of multimodal. And, and so you're like, OK, was there anything before 2015? So there's at least the behavioral era, the computational era, the interaction era, and I would say the deep learning era. There's, uh, and then I definitely the course is about the deep learning era. That's what we will focus on. But I, I had to at least put like four slides on the other eras. Otherwise, I will um, I feel bad about this. So the behavioral era, in fact, there was even a, a one before that slightly. But like the when you search for multimodal, like, like in Google Scholar for papers before 2000, uh, 1970s, then it would be multimodal because it's multiple modes of a distribution, like so it's a more uh, in the statistical sense uh, of it. Um, there is a multimodal that came early on uh, in a psychology, and there's also one in uh, the study of transportation. 
multimodal with multiple mode of transportation and they still use it so there's a lot of really interesting paper on that uh and so, but that, so there were those three kind of um there's a key moment which i will uh, in the 80s uh that in psychology uh um with the maker effect and that, and then that's where really the multimodal uh, computational came in uh especially with other visual speech recognition uh, and then with, with that followed after. So um, if I had to push uh, or suggest one uh, author, there's so many authors from, from the work of behavioral science studying multimodal, uh, and, and still now a uh, very interesting line of research. But one is uh, David McNeil. I really like his work on language and vision. Um, for, 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 for McNeil, because there was a, a question before, maybe because there were many linguists, and his background is also linguistic, psycholinguist. They like they've been studying language for so long that they were like, "Oh, gestures is just a side effect of language. Like, like I'm producing like a spoken language, then my gesture is just a side effect of this. It's like I have something to say. The important message always comes from language, and then gesture comes from it." He, then he was in that debate, uh, but uh, he was never doing it yet at that point, like in a cognitive science way, like fMRI and all this, but just behaviorally try to understand that problem. Um, his uh, hypothesis is in fact that um, you have a message to share and, and, and then language and gestures just come from it. Like he has an intent, like a pragmatic way of doing it. And then you're just sharing that uh, from it. So really great work. Um, uh, even one of our um, stellar professor here, uh, Justin Cassell worked with him. Um, so a great work came uh, from that. Um, and then the mega effect. And I just realized I did not uh, put, so we'll see how this works. Um, Hmm, we'll see. Okay, we'll see if we get the mega effect to work. Otherwise, watch it in the recording. Um, for this, this is a time where you cannot look at your computer, you cannot look at your phone, you cannot. This is where you have to look at the screen. And let's see if it will work. Um, it try to see which phoneme has been spoken. Ba, 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 ba. Try again. Ba, 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 definitely. Ba, ba, ba. Oh, we kind of hear it, huh? Okay. Um, no, that's sad. Okay. Uh, next time I will test. I, I, oh, I see why. Okay. Let's try this. We'll try again. Ba, ba, no, ba, okay. ba, ba, ba. I'm not sure why there is a delay. Sorry about this. But uh, let's try one last time and then see if it works. Ba, 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 ba. ba. Okay. So I think the system had, needs a few seconds to realize, oh, there's some audio. Maybe I should show it. So you, you, you heard hopefully the second half of that video and it said one thing. Now I'm going to show the same, uh, another video and, and look again and hear. Oh. Ah. Ba, 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 ba. Okay, the next one. Oh. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't like me, huh? Okay. Sorry. Uh, that that yeah, it, doing a multimodal lecture is a little bit challenging here. Okay. Let's try one time. Look at it. Ah, uh, that's what the issue is. One of the video. Anyway. Okay. Um, really amazing video. And you will have blow your mind. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, so the general idea is uh, you, the first video you should have heard uh, ba, uh, fa, ba, 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 and the second one fa, 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 and the cool part was that it's exactly the same audio clip, exactly the same audio clip, the only difference is the visual, like the only difference is the visual aspect of it, 
So it's really exciting. It's also cool because when I give show it, usually I, I just play it. And sometimes I don't even look at the screen. I'm like, oh, is it is there a failure? Because I'm hearing the same fa, fa, fa both times. Uh, but then I look back, I'm like, okay, no, fa, fa. Um, so um, it got people really excited, this idea of, uh, uh, of suddenly like, oh, mega effect. So that's the reason speech recognition was not working. It's like we were not doing it. Um, it seems that we'll, uh, okay. Uh, we, we were like, that, like there's a problem and it's, we should have done audiovisual. And that's what happened in the early, uh, in the eighties is the audiovisual speech recognition. What we realized at that point is mega effect, unfortunately is the exception and more than the rule. It turned out there are a few phonemes like this, but most of it is redundant. That the same information, which is extremely useful in communication because that redundancy allows for robustness. And that's really what came out from audiovisual speech recognition about this is that if you, uh, one of your signal is really noisy, then the other can step in and help with this. Around uh, a little bit, uh, but soon after, like in the 90s, there was a lot of work on multimodal interface. Uh, even my own PhD advisor, Trevor Darrell and, and Sandy Pentland, they were like, put this there. Like, because there was, at that point, like there's some really cool videos from the 90s of like moving things around and put this there and like interfaces. Now I know these days you're like uh, moving it on the touch screen and all this. But that was uh, the beginning of this. And it was uh, effective computing uh, as a follow-up to that where what if computers start having emotion or at least perceive emotion? Having emotion is a different debate, uh, but at least uh, perceive emotion uh, and share or express emotion. Um, and then I will say one area that uh, really interesting in the 90s was, I, I know by now it sounds obvious, but the before YouTube, uh, YouTube before YouTube, like understanding multimedia content, especially audio video content. And with a goal of maybe a little bit like a library kind of being able to index. At that point, they were like, oh, we're gonna index all video. By now we understand that indexing works or should work differently with the large scale that we have. Um, in fact, some of these work also was very important at CMU back in the days. Um, so, and then um, the step, I mean, a lot of the work that I talked about continued in the 2000s, but one thing I think that came in in the 2000s is the uh, social aspect as well. Um, uh, uh, one of the project is the Kalo. Um, and if you know about Siri, Apple Siri, it came from that project uh, where it was the idea of having an assistant um, uh, to help you with different tasks. Uh, a lot on uh, social signal processing, a lot of these projects. And finally, 2000, um, in fact, to be exact, deep learning 2006, but then uh, it took a few years for it to come in computer vision. There was a good landmark paper, uh, 2010, uh, uh, about this to recognize objects. And the first multimodal, and that's a very interesting, like. The, the, the title of the paper was Multimodal Deep Learning. So we're done, <laughs> the, the paper is done. Multimodal Deep Learning was uh, a great paper in 2011, one of the first, at least using deep learning for multimodal data. What, what do you think are the first application they use? What was the first application for multimodal? Yeah. Capture, uh, that, that, that comes really soon. Uh, I didn't put the right paper, but show and tell 2014, I will say is the beginning of language and vision research. That, that like image captioning is really the beginning, but that 2011 was back to the, the beginning. Audiovisual speech recognition. So they, they went for the basic, like that was what the first audiovisual, uh, the first multimodal, they went for that. Um, so a lot of these were often uh, more in that area. But yeah, the key moment was uh, show and tell. I, I put a follow-up paper here, but a show and tell was the image captioning. And, and why, why did multimodals uh, suddenly bloom? And it often came under the umbrella of language and vision research at that point. 
the first two are kind of the obvious ones, new larger data set, new multimodal data set, and more computation. That was often something that came in. Uh, so why did CNN convolution neural network work so well? And 20 years earlier, when it was first introduced, was not uh, giving the same performance. So these first two came often as as a as 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 a reason, but there there's these two things that happen as well, because images are, are very high dimensional, uh, many pixels, and and so uh, the the feature the descriptors for it um, were uh, very uh, high dimensional or, or very localized uh, features, um, so it was a hard and but. In 2010, with the reintroduction of CNN convolution neural network to the computer vision community, suddenly we take these high dimensional and bring it into a vector that's still high dimensional, but a lot less. It's a nice summarization of the image that I have seen. Um, and we'll discuss CNN a little bit more next week. Around the same time, language, had always in the past or almost at the time kind of be seen as a token. In fact, there was a lot of work on feature engineering to take a word like a token, like a word and, and find a feature out of it. And often it, it would be a zero one feature like, like is that word part of my dictionary or is that word a word that uh, a verb or is that word a word before a verb? There was this whole like long list of but suddenly, with this word to vec around that time, which takes uh, the idea of masking, uh, and we'll discuss more about this, um, is that suddenly it becomes a vector. So words are represented as a vector, and images are represented as a vector. So it is multimodal, but you can see the homogeneity coming back because now you have two vectors. They're not exactly like it's not like completely homogeneous but they're a lot closer to each other. And that's why there's some really landmark work that came from that after that to start studying how to integrate these. And, and I would say up to now, we're still bringing often things back to these representation and then do the fusion from those more homogeneous ones. Um, so just to summarize like these old work that we will not overemphasize, but uh, the audiovisual was definitely one of the first application. Uh, analyzing video, which still continues up to now. I will say, if you have interest in like uh, information retrieval, image retrieval, video retrieval, TrekVid is a great thing. It's uh, that happened in late to uh, early 2000. And yeah, the, the birth of multimodal as we know it, or the birth of language and vision is image captioning. By the way, MS Coco was not the first one doing image captioning. There was some great work, uh, but really like even like 10 years before that, but it got it to a level where, oh my gosh, people were like, yeah, it's maybe possible to do really uh, real world image captioning. And so the data sets were bigger and they revisited it with deep learning. So that was, so what I want to share, which is really the purpose for this class and also to help you decide on your, um, on your course project. So image captioning was always great, uh, but uh, some issue with it. What is the issue? Anybody doing generation? Like uh, anybody work on machine translation? Uh, maybe, yes, okay. One of the main challenge is uh, evaluation. I just, I got a translation. I translate it in the other language. How do I evaluate it? And that same thing happened with image captioning. It's like a caption, but is it a good caption? And then, yes, I can compare with the 10 other captions I got for that image, but it could still be a good caption and just not in those 10. So then um, the image and video captioning eventually changed. And I will say the uh, still very popular up to now uh, paradigm for many data sets these days is question answering. And, and the reason for that uh, is I believe one of the main reason is evaluation. Like it's, it's, it's uh, um, the, the idea will be you have an image, you have a question and then an answer, but then the answer will have a small subset. Either it's a predefined set of answer or short answer. Now, if you end up with very long answers to those questions, then you're back to the same challenge of 
of, of, of evaluation. So that's something to take in mind. So in visual question answering and video question answering all came around the same time. And then, there, then we started seeing a multimodal dialogue, large scale, and, and, and a, lot, a lot more. In fact, um, uh, we tried to help you and took, we have more than 100 uh, data sets, and we put them in uh, six, no, seven, and seven uh, classification. Uh, some data sets could have been more than one, I will say. Uh, one is more like affect recognition, emotion, personality, uh, media description, image captioning, video captioning, multimodal question answering, like image question answering, and then navigation, where suddenly it's no more just image, but also there is a, a you're moving in the environment. Um, and then the dialogue, social interaction, event recognition, and then retrieval as well. So multimodal data set, this is, this is our attempt. We color coded it. It is subjective, uh, but I just realized I'm putting those slides online. So maybe people would be angry that I put their data set as a one and not a three. Um, so, but our attempt was, was a little bit like how many previous papers were there? How many, um, how easy it is to get the data, so how easy it is to uh, get the, and how recent the paper is. Um, so um, there's a lot of really interesting thing, for example, mustard, although small, uh, I forget what it is, about sarcasm, it's kind of interesting. And, and, and so, so um, I, I'm not going to that list myself now, but you should, that's your homework uh, to help you to do this because we're in the world of Instagram and like anything, just a title doesn't mean anything, you need an image. So there's an appendix to this lecture where we try for every data set to give you an image, an Instagram image for each of those data sets and the link to that. So take a moment to look at the appendix. We also try to create a list. And this is like, I was tempted to not even put that slide there just because I don't want to, to have the last thing that would be sad is to have like six teams on the same data set. Um, and there's so many great data sets out there. Like, don't over focus on that. But if you don't know or don't know yet, like, these are good places to start. They're not the only one, but they're good places to start. I'm going to give a little bit of details on them. And also, I will give you details on a few data sets, which I thought think are just landmark data set that is impossible not to talk about. But please explore more than that. So um, there's a, for affect and emotion, it's impossible to talk about affect and emotion and not talk about that series of data set that were created that's called audiovisual emotion challenges. There were like about eight of them. They really brought in the early 2010, I think the first one was maybe 11, 2011 try to bring multimodal to the affect computing, but don't use them for your project. And uh, they're a little bit, uh, or be careful if you, you're there. They've been there for a long time. There are a lot of work on them. So uh, they, there's some more recent, but I will say in general, they're interesting, but and uh, historically they're really great, uh, but they're often really small. And some of the data has been harder to find like students trying to use it uh, had to other, but it, Historically, it's impossible for me to not mention it. Um, one um, that is large, um, has quite a few ways. I almost put it as a two. Um, it, is, it was done in my group. So uh, I try not to push too many of our, our own uh, um, data set, but it is a good one to start. Like it's a, for, even for our group, it's kind of a data set 101. Um, it's a multimodal sentiment um, uh, analysis and emotion recognition. It has, the reason I still kept it there is that's 25,000 video clip annotated. So it's a good size. There is an, another one that I didn't put in the list, which is Moses, uh, which uh, has uh, four different languages other than language, uh, other than uh, English, sorry. Um, I think it's Spanish, uh, maybe French. I forgot with the four languages, maybe Portuguese was one of them. But yeah, um, uh, these are interesting, large, um, but there's been a little bit of work on that. Um, the, um, 
and there's a little bit that th these are just to give you examples. So in this case, what you want to do is uh, in a lot of the affect recognition, it's a lot of a fusion problem. You're given many modalities. You want to integrate in such a way that you can predict the emotion. Um, the interesting part in these uh, will be about how do you integrate, how you do the fusion. So if you're interested about how to learn good multimodal uh, representations, uh, that would be a good data set for to test that. Also, if you're interested in, in studying local uh, alignment between words and nonverbal behaviors, that would be another data set as well for that. Uh, MS Coco uh, is another data set uh, that I need to talk about, but you should not use for your research. It's just, it was the first one on image captioning where you show an image, uh, a large scale image captioning. So that one was 120,000 images, each of them with a description uh, underneath. The challenge with it is that it was uh, very hard. Uh, the, 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 the classic thing was to look at the uh, objective measures of, um, like if you look at uh, like the best algorithm uh, on MS Coco and look at the metrics that are computed automatically. What are the metrics that are computed automatically? Someone was uh, uh, in machine translation. So machine translation likes French and likes colors. Okay, so they, they like blue, rouge, and I forgot what it is, other color that they may have. Here. But yeah, so the, the, the metrics they create in machine translation to see if a translation is good, uh, come from acronyms that spell B-L-E-U, blue uh, and blue and uh, rouge came later and uh, I'm sure there are other colors that came out after that. But yeah, so these metrics, what they do is they will look at your prediction um, and look at the, all the translations I got, all the generated, they're going through and you will try to match it. There's different ways you can do word by words. Often the words are in the, any of these. Um, so there's different of these metric rouge, I think it looks at those unigram. I think there's a background version of it. Uh, anyway, I will not try to, but the general idea is, so if you look at those metrics, how well blue and rouge are, and you, you rank them, and then you do the separate, and you do human judgment, which is really the ground truth there. You show the generated from the algorithm, and they really ask human, it's time consuming, you cannot scale as much, but it's really the ground truth the ordering did not match. Like the ordering of the algorithm almost swapped. Not exactly some case, but like, like those big algorithms that were like overfitted in a sense, probably on this. And then the human judgment was not. So, so that's why MS Coco came in. And that's why then VQA came. VQA is another data set I need to talk about, but I cannot uh, let you work on it. Uh, and I, you can if you want, but, uh, but it's a great, uh, Drew and, and Debbie did amazing work on this. It's, 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 it, it, the idea is a question and answer. So you're given an image, you're given a question and you're given one or many answers, uh, but the answers are short. And that's why it's, if it's a yes, no answer, then then you know, or if it's a number, uh, you will know. I will say um, these kind of questions are not the norm in it. Um, there, there's a really interesting question, but it's some that are a little bit more obvious or repetitive uh, in these. And that's why they did the VQA 2.0, but there's a lot of more VQA that came after that. Um, VQA, uh, which instead of doing on image, do it on video, like the video analysis. So social interaction, short clip, and a question and an answer. Um, one that I like very much also TV QA. So now what's really nice in this one, first one is YouTube video. So each video are separate from each other. Why TV QA is the same character. I think it's a TV show Friends. So the same characters come over and over. So maybe you can take advantage of that. So TV QA is, is really interesting. Um, and then that's, don't do this one, do the next version, but there is a, 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 a I, I told you about reasoning as a really important aspect of, of intelligence and multimodal. And so there are data sets 
out there that really force the algorithm as much as they can, force them to um, uh, do reasoning. And so um, here, like there is at least one tower with four blocks with a yellow block at the base and a blue block at the top. So for a human, it may be easy. Uh, for, um, for a computer, may be very hard. So these are synthetic version of that. And then this one is, is the one I will suggest. It's a nice, I mean, if you are to do this, the, the second version, maybe you use the first version, the synthetic, just to debug your things. I told you like a synthetic data set is always good, but it's the same idea where um, the statement to find out if the statement is really aligned with the image, you really need to reason about the details and how these different components come together. Um, that's an example of a nice, interesting data set. Also, because it's images, um, that's something about the number of GPUs you have in your basement. So if you're in basement, you have a lot of GPUs and you can do use all of them for your project, then maybe you want to do video based. But if you have uh, access just maybe of the coupons we will give you, then maybe you wanna go with something more like image based just to be more realistic. Um, there is a, a web QA, uh, which with this one is also uh, to answer correctly, you can see a, yeah, this one doesn't happen. You can see a castle in the background, October Fest. So then, oh, sorry, the question. At which festival can you see a castle in the background? And, and, the, and the idea here is that you will need information from more than one source to answer that question, and you will need to link them. That's the why the reason that's why it's a kind of a multi-hop reasoning concept. So this is the uh, C, what it is more about C has kind of a, question answering and also reasoning inside it. We almost split them because they're like, so you have affect, you have image captioning, we don't see it as often, so that's B. C has like two things, question answer and these reasoning that are really interesting. And then there's like the robot one. Like it's no more just language vision, but I also have the possibility of doing um, uh, moving in the environment. There's one that we, I think we put in red and, and we, I love this work and there's really great work like Alfred and all of these, but there's, you have to be careful. Some of those data sets about navigation, if you're not careful, they come with simulators that are sometimes hard to run, takes a long time to put together. So we're, we're, if you go in the uh, arena of navigating, Big one data set that is uh, one like room to room is interesting. What they did is that uh, you know how you, when you buy a house with Zillow and all this, you can visit the house. Uh, some of them, the automatic. So they took that, the, this, and then they did direction go in the bedroom and pick up uh, uh, the pills on the bed table. I mean, idea reality is that you cannot pick object in those Zillow thing, but it, you can move in around this. So room to room is a great one. And then they created an, a follow-up, which is room across room, which is just a larger, more uh, fluid version of it. This is great. This is a good one. But these other data set that require this whole uh, sim sim uh, simulators, be a little bit careful. Um, there is also uh, Wiener Ground is one that we suggest uh, where same word, different order, different image. And it's really, this one could have been in the, the C. It's really about compositionality, reasoning of image and caption. Uh, I talk about emotion. And in fact, this one is in A, but it's also in E because it's about dialogue and emotion. Uh, this is a really nice, interesting follow-up. Uh, yeah. And finally, um, two last one. Um, there is the one on, uh, there's a whole area of cooking videos. Why people love cooking in AI? Because there's a lot of structure in a, a recipe. There's a lot of really good uh, structure in a recipe. And so they do use that. Um, and then there's this IKEA 
data set that is a retrieval, like based on the description, try to find the right IKEA items. So a few just quick uh, advice. Uh, I mentioned it, just be aware of how many GPUs you have when you select, talk with potential teammates, but be careful uh, selecting that. We try to suggest, when we suggested some uh, data sets that don't require as much computation, um, we will give uh, Google uh, Cloud and Amazon, uh, and I think also uh, Microsoft Azure tickets or coupons. Um, but you're not getting infinite. Like, so I think you get 50 uh, per, per, per student. We can sometimes give a second, maybe a third one, but don't expect you're getting one every week. So, um, so just be careful. Um, so the main thing for next week, uh, project preference is due on Tuesday. Uh, reading assignment is due on Friday. We'll post it on Monday, uh, but you need to make your selection by Friday and bring your laptop for the lecture highlights, uh, you have to take some notes. So, okay, thank you. I'm curious. Uh,